Welcome to episode 497. On today's show, why do black seminarians graduate with a lot more student debt than whites? And what does it mean for churches? Then a recent Gospel Coalition article by Elisa Childers argues that the word deconstruction is universally bad and should not be redeemed. Is she right? And Phil, Caitlin, and I take Childers' online quiz to determine whether or not we are progressive Christians. Then I talk to Anglican priest and author Tish Harrison Warren about her recent controversial article in the New York Times saying it's time to go back to in-person worship and to end online streaming services. All of that, plus Phil learns an interesting lesson on Twitter about posting COVID data. Before we jump in, another reminder that we're quickly approaching our 500th episode and we are inviting our Patreon supporters to participate in helping us produce that show. There's two things you can do. First off, you can give us a brief voice memo sharing your favorite memory of the Holy Post, a story, an article, some way it's really blessed or benefited you. We're going to use some of those actual recordings from our Patreon supporters in the 500th episode. Or if you're more artistic, we invite you to submit design proposals for special 500th episode merchandise for the Holy Post. You can do all of this on our Patreon page. So if you're not a Patreon supporter yet, now's your chance. Go to holypost.com and hit the support us button and you can find out how you can contribute to the 500th episode. Okay, here is episode 497. Hey there, this is Phil Vischer. Welcome back to the Holy Post podcast. I am here with Caitlin Chess. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, Phil. And Sky Jatani. Hi, Sky. Hi, Phil. And Jason Ruggs also here. Hi, Jason. Hey there. And we are here for your, not their dining pleasure, their listening pleasure, their learning pleasure. What sort of pleasure are we trying to provide? Intellectual pleasure? Boy, I'm you guys sure are giving me pleasure should be looks. our goal. Yeah, that's a good, that's a very good point, Sky. <laughs> yeah. We're here to make you miserable. <laughs> In the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, it's time for the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Caitlin. Was that was that better, guys? Are you happier with? Mm, there's got to oh, be something in between. Okay, why two. are we here, Caitlin? Tell me. Ooh, I'm the last person <laughs> you should be asking. I don't know. We are here. Okay, okay, you can say this though. Why are you here, Caitlin? Because there are important conversations. Oh, well, that's not nice. But there are important conversations to be had, and I think you all have built something thoughtful and helpful to people. Oh, see, uh, see okay. that was actually really nice. I was worried yeah. you were going to say something like. I'm not entirely sure either, but this is a great break from the real intellectual conversations I have. Oh, at Duke. no, right? no, 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 okay. no. You know why no. she wouldn't say that, Sky? Because she's not mean, Sky. That is true. She doesn't say mean things. Now that those of us that follow her on Twitter see the face she makes when she sees a baby. We know there's not a mean bone in Caitlin Shess's body. It is actually really nice because here, like, there are not a lot of people keeping up with evangelical culture, Twitter, Twitter yeah. stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, people do not. I have to explain to my advisor. I had to tell him what an ex-evangelical was. Oh, or let okay. you know. So it's fun to talk to people that are paying attention to that kind of stuff, like I am. Yeah, and it's yeah. it's not a, a group of of superhuman evangelicals with powers to save the universe. No, no. <laughs> Who, us? Or <laughs> like the X Men? The X Evangelicals. <laughs> oh, the X. I see. Oh, okay. Okay. First of all, I learned some things this week, this last week. I learned some things. I wanted to share them with you guys because I know that you always want to know what has Phil learned in the last week? I know you wake up at night thinking that. Okay, never mind. A um, <laughs> couple of things I learned on Twitter. I learned people have strong feelings about the trucker protests in Canada. That was also, I learned that from our last podcast and some of the comments. Strong feelings. Strong we didn't really feelings have a lot of people. We didn't, we didn't have a lot of time last week to dive deeply into that no, topic. So I no, wonder I, if. And I don't think we covered it very well. Yeah. Or really covered it at all. <laughs> we really covered it at all. But there's lots of talk on, on, you know, particularly the right side of the spectrum in Canada and America about tyranny and is, you know, this is mm. the prime minister of Canada acting like a tyrant. And uh, do Christians have a responsibility to stand up to tyranny? And I just want to say as an official position, I am not going to get into that. <laughs> 
You're not going to get into that just for the Canadian context or for America either. Uh, we uh, do, do Christians have a responsibility mm. to? St- well, it's more how do we define tyranny? You know, like seatbelt laws are seatbelt laws tyranny that we need to stand up against. Um, our mask requirements in a in a church or a theater, you know, tyranny that we need to stand up against. I guess what I guess the only thing that really bothers me, and this is the only thing that bothers me at all in in life. This is it. <laughs> this is the thing that bothers me. Um, is isn't as much whether. You know, are they, they want us to wear stuff or not wear stuff or get vaccinated or not get vaccinated. It's it's assuming whoever the they is, is that their motives are impure, hmm. you know, that they want to take away. Like if, if you're on the conservative side and then you happen to have a liberal president who wants some sort of public health standard enforced, it's because he wants to take away all our freedom. And if you are you know, a, a liberal and you have a conservative president or a conservative governor and they want more restriction on abortion, it's because they hate women and they want to, you know, turn back the clock. And, and we always start with the assumption that if I sat down and talked to them, they would not have a valid perspective on this topic. That's what bothers me. Right. Because yeah. right and wrong, good and evil is no longer defined by the act itself. It's defined by which tribe is it coming from? Yes. So right. even if there's nothing inherently evil about being asked to wear a mask during a pandemic, the fact that I'm being told to do that by a president from the left side of the spectrum means it's evil. Yes, it must be. It right. must be. Um, so I also, I tweeted, I saw a really interesting graph on Twitter. And you know, I don't, if you see an interesting graph on Twitter, just count to 10 slow down, then ask your wife if you should retweet it (laughs) and do whatever your wife says. Uh, It was a graph that showed, I thought it was interesting, so I retweeted it. Kind of Maybe it was a mistake. It was a graph that showed that there's a direct correlation between death rate from coronavirus and a county's support for Donald Trump. So the yeah. the more basically the more red a county is, the higher the death rate from coronavirus. And if I, I remember seeing you retweet this, Phil. Yeah, and yeah. people thinking, didn't like it. People thinking didn't like he's it. he's a brave man. People he's a brave like man. I, didn't, I don't know what I was thinking. Well, <laughs> and the, the other the other thing that was kind of the the red flag to me. Not I, I'm not questioning the data at all, but I think yes. the response you got was partly because of the source of that graph. It was the New York Times. It was the New York Times. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we know they're up to no good. No, it was. But but the biggest the biggest part of the pushback was that, like, you must be you must be tweeting this to try to make Republicans look bad or Trump supporters look bad. When in reality, if you were a sane, balanced, kind person, you would point out that, oh, it's probably just the death rate is higher because rural America is less healthy and has less access to health care. And, uh, and I, and an older, you know, so there were more comorbidities, so more people died, you know, and I tried to point out that the, that was more the case earlier in the pandemic and later in the pandemic, particularly post vaccine, you're about 20 times more likely to die if you're unvaccinated. And we know as of, I even pointed this out as of last September, um, 92% of Democrats were vaccinated and only 58% of Republicans with, at that point, 40% of Republicans say they had no intention of being vaccinated. Not that it just hadn't happened yet, but that it wasn't going to happen. And that has changed somewhat since then, as more people started dying in red America. But it's still, there's a huge, my point was, this was the point I was making. Okay, Sky, tell me if it was not a good idea to try to make this point. My point was, it is sad, sad, not ha ha ha, that you guys are dumb. It, it is sad that um, the pandemic became politicized so that there's a partisan divide over how we respond, which is actually causing people to die. That was my point. Yes. And it, it, it's not just on the right, though. So I was in Southern California this weekend with my son. And one morning we got up early. We went to Starbucks to, to get some tea and breakfast. We were driving through Burbank, right by like all the Hollywood studios. And it was a beautiful day, and we saw multiple people outside jogging, as one does in Southern California on a beautiful Saturday morning. And they were like, 
in virtual hazmat suits running outside, like the full face shield, multiple masks, like plastic gloves on. It was insane. And I'm like, there's no one else. It isn't like they're running in a right. marathon. There's no one right. around them. They're all alone. But Sky, and, but Sky, were they dead? That's yeah. That's a fair point. <laughs> they know how to stay alive. I think the point I'm trying to make is that okay. whether it's rural red state Republican communities or urban uh, blue state highly progressive communities, we all have taken our response to the pandemic not from scientific or common sense approaches, but from what virtue signals to our tribe that we're one of you, Mm. right? So not wearing a mask, downplaying the pandemic, not getting vaccinated is the way you are included in the tribe in some red state communities and taking the thing hyper seriously. And even after the mask mandate is gone, still having a full hazmat suit out when you run and jog and, and yeah, yeah, that's the way you virtue signal on the extreme left. And both sides are doing it because they're more shaped by their community pressures than they are from actual data yeah. or common sense. I always know how much I've incensed people by how many people separately, individually tweet something to the extent of stick to the vegetables. <laughs> you know, like you're out of your lane. <laughs> also Dumb. good for your health. Dummy. Go back to your vegetables. And I think this was a three, it was a three stick to your vegetables um, cal- calamity. But I also got a, you know, you are a horrible, horrible person. That was a, that was one that was solid sent at me. So, yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to tweet about uh, controversial things anymore. I You're just, just going to podcast about them? <laughs> I just don't know if it's worth it. I just don't know if it's worth it. Okay. Um, Caitlin, do you have anything to add? Do you have any advice for me? Uh <laughs> No, I have no advice for you. But I do think it's interesting. Just it's such a good reminder that as much as we have such an emphasis, like in our culture on the hard facts and data will tell us the truth about things. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be involved in a story. Like there's always has to be some explanation where that data fits into a larger account of how people are. And so as much as that data can be really important and instructive, there's no freewheeling numbers out there that tell us what makes how to make sense of the world. You're always kind of finding a narrative to put it in. And my narrative, Caitlin Chess, is the Bible. I, I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And that's why I know that I'm not going to say anything about the truckers. Or the yeah, wind. probably not. That's a good idea. Good idea. <laughs> Stick to the vegetables. I'm like thinking, which, which side should I come down on that would, that would make me laugh? And I'm not, it's all mm, just a disaster. Mm, mm, it's mm, just mm. a disaster. Most of the things I say are like, what, what am I thinking of right now that I find amusing? And then afterwards mm. you find out, oh, other people took that in a different way. This and sounds like personal growth. Does it? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. That's encouraging. It's, uh, Do you think it would be any better if you were an actual comedian, Phil? <laughs> like, would people understand that you're just trying to be I'm, I'm hoping that wasn't amusing. an insult. <laughs> well, well, Do you Phil, think your bio says if you were actually funny? No, no, like, my bio know. says I'm a humorist. Right. No, and so it's like, you know, you're halfway oh. in between. I'm halfway. Okay. I'm what, half what's a the, comedian. What's the difference between a humorist and a comedian? <laughs> a, a humorist makes you go, mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the difference. This is, oh, that was humorous. <laughs> That's what I strive for. So it's a difference between a chuckle and a belly laugh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, comedian makes you want to, you know, spit stuff out of your mouth and then order five more drinks, you know. Ah, <laughs> another round for our table. That's what a comedian wants. A humorist wants to read you something dryly and have you say, <laughs> and maybe, you know, kind of laugh through your nose <laughs> like that. <laughs> We don't want people to get too, you know, <laughs> bent out of shape. We don't want them to spit or spill anything. Well, or you know. it sounds like that response may depend largely on culture, right? Because <laughs> you know, some people are more demonstrative in their humor. That's true. That's true. And so some a, people... a, a nasal chuckle from some Northern Europeans could be the most, you know, rancorous thing they ever do. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Phil Vischer, master of the nasal chuckle. That's what my T-shirt will say. Um, so I, I realized it was Black History Month. We didn't talk much about issues um, facing our black Christian brothers and sisters. But this story, I'd grabbed this a couple of weeks ago to talk about and then ran out of time, which I thought was interesting. And it's an angle that I hadn't really heard about, but it's worth talking about. Black seminary grads 
uh, graduate from seminary with more debt than non-black seminary grads. So data shows that, for example, in the 2020 to 2021 academic year, about 30% of black seminary grads had more than $40,000 in debt. And there were only 11% of white grads had that amount of debt. And if you dive into it, there are a number of reasons that you, some you might think of, but others you wouldn't. Like, for example, a lot of seminary grads uh, get scholarships, get various grants and scholarships. Sometimes they're supported by their own church or their own denomination to go to seminary. And if you're going to a historically black seminary or coming from a historically black church, there's generally less funding available. There's less grants, um, less of an endowment at the seminary, and probably your home church is less wealthy than a white uh, seminary attendee who might get a grant from their own church or own denomination. So this is another way that hadn't even occurred to me, you know, where because of how we historically you know, marginalized African-Americans into certain areas of town where then there wasn't as much economic development and there wasn't as much wealth creation. You not, not only have poorer households, you have poorer churches. Um, and when you even when you gather all those churches together in a denomination, it's a poor denomination. And uh, if they start seminaries, they're poorer seminaries. And you don't really think about that until you look at something like this. And the result is, if you're from a poor community, you're African-American, you've grown up in a poor community, in a poor denomination, you end up having to come up with more of your own money to go to seminary, which means you're coming out with more debt. But now you're going right back to the poor community, um, unless you're going to you know, move out to the suburbs so that you can get paid more, so you can pay off your student debt. So in a way, we're robbing the poor communities of the talent that they're producing in seminary because of poverty. Right. So this is the continuing effect of uh, not accumulating generational wealth at the same rate that white communities have generated generational wealth. And it's the vicious cycle. Correct. Yeah. Correct. We shouldn't be surprised that it affects every part of a community, not just household wealth. Yeah. And it seems like something that if we're aware of it, we could actually do something about it. You know, you could set up scholarship funds for seminaries to use, you know, for minority applicants or to help help subsidize minority uh, seminaries so that, you know, you don't, so that you're not coming out with more debt than you would if you were born in the suburbs, which just seems like a bad reason to have more debt simply because of the zip code you were born in and the people you want to serve. You're bringing this up at an interesting time, though, Phil, because there's a lot of debate going on around the future of seminary training in general. And we talked about this a little bit last week with Glenn Packiam on with his oh, book, no. Resilient Pastor. Like a lot of pastors who went to seminary feel like it really didn't equip or train them for the reality of ministry. So it's it's a big thing. Caitlin, you're the most recent seminary grad among us. Uh, was that an ongoing conversation with you and your your peers? Yeah, I mean, so there's the the generational wealth dynamic, and then there's also the reality that most of the denominations that most of us are in have either entirely excluded Black people for the entirety of the denomination or split from a denomination in order to continue to enslave people or in order to continue segregation. And so a lot of denominations that have tons of money are, of course, the white denominations, not just because of generational wealth, but because they're older and they've had decades to kind of build wealth as a denomination or to, you know, kind of make sure they have big donors or they've attracted people that can help them. And those aren't the same possibilities. But then there's also the job dynamic, which the article talked about, of like you could go into some level of debt if you felt confident that you were going to have a job that would pay you really well. And a lot of the churches that have a ton of money are not hiring black graduates. And I would also imagine so then there's also the gender dynamic. I would imagine that for black women, it's even worse because for women in general, getting a job in a lot of churches is harder. So you have that like gender dynamic, but you also have, like you were saying, Sky, the problem of as much as, you know, the seminary I went to was actually pretty incredibly racially and ethnically diverse, much more than the one I'm at now, ironically. But there is the question of like, what kind of education you are receiving and if that matches the community that you're going into. So I've had right. a conversation with someone here who's teaching preaching to MDiv students and she has some black students in her class and she's like, the things that I am teaching come from my background. Like, yes, it's like homiletical theory, but it's also 
these are the churches I grew up in that shaped what my expectations for preaching are or what shaped my expectations for pastoral care or whatever, you know, and so I can't, I'm, am I actually equipping them with what they need for the churches that they're going into? Or am I just kind of recycling what's happened in our churches that either are not applicable or could be better by being enriched by those church traditions. But even if we kind of try and make sure that there's economic opportunities for students, you're always lagging behind when it comes to professors, making sure people are well enough right. educated to then be teaching. So any seminary that's trying really hard to put financial resources behind students also needs to be really concerned with hiring the right kind of people, not only so that they're teaching you know, from their own cultural context to students that need that, but also for mentoring possibilities for relationships. Like if you have an all white seminary faculty, which lots of conservative <laughs> seminaries do have nearly or all white seminary faculties, even if you can up your numbers by offering scholarships to black or, you know, students of color, you're, you're not going to be very useful. It might not be helpful for them either just on a practical mm -hmm. level, or it might actually be really deeply damaging. We also have that problem both with people of color and with women where we could fix some of the financial like dynamics that are going on, but are we just enticing people to come to a place that will be really harmful to them? It won't equip them for the ministry that they want to do. And it might actually like their presence there might be really difficult for yeah. them. So those are all of those other dynamics that even if we fix some of the economic dynamics involved, we're not fixing everything. Right. So, well, so it's it's, it's kind of like, you know, do we want to put, do we want to spend more money um, underwriting big white private colleges for minority students? Or do we want to invest more, you know, in the historically black colleges and universities, which have, you know, I have a good friend of mine that went to one of the HBC, sorry, black college. Yeah. HBC, HBCU. Mm -hmm. um, and absolutely just love the experience because he was, you know, for the first time in an environment where um, he, he was around almost entirely African-American students who all wanted to excel, you know, and it was the notion of we all are here and we, you know, no one is telling us that we should just focus on sports. You know, no one is telling us uh, that we should stick with the uh, the stereotypes that many of us grew up in, you know, and people come out of those schools doing amazing things. So I do think there is a value yeah. of, you know, this historically black institution has its own historically black seminary. Can we help it get better funding rather than trying to fund the students away from it to, you know, my seminary, which I prefer and I'm more comfortable with? Yeah, it's, it's, I don't know if there's a clear answer to that because when I was in seminary, I went in in 1998 and I benefited greatly from having people in my classes who were not just from the white church experience and had that. So it helped me as a student. And then the two professors I was closest to, one was Asian American, one was African American. And I benefited enormously from their input and teaching and not just their classes, but from just their uh, mentoring of me formally and informally. I remember being at a, in an ethics class in seminary taught by an older white man. And at one point it occurred to me, like everything we were talking about in this seminary ethics class was all things you were terrified your daughter would do in sub in white suburbia. <laughs> like we, we didn't talk at all about race. We didn't talk mm. at all about poverty. We didn't talk at all about a whole bunch of issues, but we spent a lot of time on premarital sex, homosexuality, abortion, a little bit on capital punishment. And they took this professor had a very conservative approach to that. And like, but we weren't covering a bunch of other issues that I would argue are still ethical, theological and biblical issues because they just weren't on the radar of this professor at all. So I can understand why somebody coming from uh, a community that's dealing with racism or poverty or diversity, or some of these other things would be really frustrated in a class like that. And some of them yeah. were, but I was also really grateful they were in a class like that because they were sitting next to me and I benefited from my interaction with that student. Right. But do they need to change schools for your benefit? Yes, they do. They need to come to me and accommodate to my <laughs> needs and desires so that I am improved. But okay. that, that's a faculty thing, too, of yeah. like, on one hand, yeah, I would love to see predominantly white denominations fund black students in any you know, and any seminary, you don't have to go to ours to kind of get mm -hmm. money or to fund, mm -hmm. you know, people, uh, you know, denominations themselves to help create partnerships so that they can hire people and pay them a better wage to to minister there. But also, I mean, it really like the impact of better hiring practices in a lot of those seminaries is huge. But the problem is, 
a lot of the time we have really narrow denominational standards or just doctrinal standards. And we're really kind of scared about anyone coming in and, and messing anything up or people that don't kind of honor the tradition in the way that we would want to or who might ask harder questions. And making faculty changes is actually sometimes way harder than making financial changes, but that could make it a safer, better place, like a more fruitful place for students from all different backgrounds to study together. Because what Sky has said is so important. It's good for you and it's good for you know everyone at the seminary to be in a diverse kind of place, but it can't be diverse and hurtful to some people and have right. that still be a good thing. Right, right. And and it's very hard to not start for, for an old institution to not start with the assumption the way we've been doing it is the right way to do it. So we yep. will let more diverse people learn the right way to do it. Yep. And you, you start out talking and not listening, which is really tough. Because if you start out listening and you realize, oh, I wonder if we need to rethink any of our traditions. Now, all of a sudden, you've got alumni and trustees up in arms saying, wait, when we said diversity, we meant different colors on, in the catalog pictures. Yep. We didn't mean different classes. Okay. Um, some of the uh, some of our friends, some of the folks that have been on the podcast that come from an African American background, have grew up in the Black Church. In some of their stories, then went to white seminaries or majority white seminaries and came to the conclusion that the way they had experienced church was wrong, and so left the Black Church, started attending you know white mega churches, and then later on had a whole deconstruction where they just felt like, you know, I was taught to turn my back on my own history, my own upbringing, my own traditions, um, you know, th that there was nothing uh, special or noble about, for example, African-American theology distinctions, that it was, you know, just a, a, a distorted or, or underdeveloped white theology. And uh, so, that brings me to the deconstruction thing where some of those people are now being criticized for you've deconstructed your faith. You've lost your faith, you know, just because you became woke or read the wrong book by the wrong person or or you're just, you know, you were hurt by a white church. So now you're deconstructing your faith. So I wanted to talk just for a bit about deconstruction because, um, uh, you know, the band Skillet. I like the band Skillet. I actually like their music. The, the uh, lead singer, John Cooper, is kind of interesting because when you start actually listening to the lyrics of it, very, very kind of hard rock, uh, screamy, but fun music. But he kind of likes to be at war. That's, that's a theme through a lot of Skillet's music is that we're under attack. We're not giving up. We're not backing down, you know, so it's, it's like nineties, uh, youth group music, mm -hmm. you know, it's like <laughs> the, the natural evolution of Carmen where, the world is out to get us kids. So put on the, the full armor of God because we're, you know, we're fighting back. And uh, so he declared a new war over the like two weeks ago. He, he was uh, in concert and took a pause out of his concert, which he does fairly often to just let me just share a bit that's on my mind. And this time uh, he said, it is time that we declare war against this deconstruction Christian movement. He's declaring war against deconstruction. He says, I don't even like calling it deconstruction Christian. There's nothing Christian about it. It is a false religion. So Who's calling it a religion? <laughs> what is he even talking about? <laughs> so he's friends with, hang on, hang with me. <laughs> I'm just confused. You're, you're, both, <laughs> like, you're memeing in stereo. It's kind of funny, the faces <laughs> that you've got. Um, Alisa Childers, you know who Alisa Childers is? Alisa Childers, Alisa, Ch anyone, anyone, Bueller, Bueller, no, nobody. I got nothing. She was, uh, one part of Zoe girl. Remember Zoe girl? Are you kidding me? <laughs> that there's another Caitlin, uh, gif right there. <laughs> I just got, got a meme out of Caitlin. I'm uh, so upset. I'm so upset. Oh, I so, love why are you Zoe upset? Girl. I haven't even I'm, said what she said. Because I, I read the article that you sent, oh. and I'm upset. Oh, I'm upset because that's our nickname for my oldest daughter. We have always called her Zoe. Girl. Oh no! Oh. So she was the singer. Okay, so so this is how she wrote a piece on the for the Gospel Coalition many years ago. My Christian beliefs were challenged intellectually by a progressive Christian pastor. It threw me into deconstruction that took several years to fully come out of. I found out later that he himself had already deconstructed and had hoped to propel his congregation into deconstruction so he could convert them to progressive Christianity. 
He was very good at it. In fact, he was almost totally successful. A few of us came back around to a historically Christian understanding of the gospel, but most did not. And this is why uh, her article is entitled, Why We Should Not Redeem Deconstruction. Because this is how she, and you say, how, do you, how are you defining deconstruction exactly, Elisa Childers, former Zoe girl? Here's how she defines deconstruction. I'm sorry, Caitlin. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> Caitlin, you, you look like a bobblehead. So hey, hey Mount, you are shaking your head. Yeah. Yeah. Zoom back. Who's beating those baby seals? Bono. Oh, no. No, it's not Bono. No, that was a joke, Caitlin. That was a joke. Okay. If you got a video online of someone killing baby seals and you zoom back and it's one of your favorite rock stars, that'd be... It's not true. It didn't okay, happen. Okay, okay, so, okay. So this is the thing I, I learned not too long ago is that your generation really had a thing about clubbing baby seals that our yeah. generation doesn't understand. Oh, like yeah. it was oh, apparently I, a problem. I for... think we finally stopped it. We finally like no, people there... actually did that. Oh yeah, like it was an annual hunt where How where do you, you think get... we got our slippers. To my, why would to we keep talking pelt, about right? Like that's why they club them. They didn't yeah, shoot them. them. Yeah. Yeah. Because you don't want a yeah. hole in the pelt of these cute little baby yeah. seals. Okay. So it was like an yeah. annual thing where, and we all went, oh no, that's the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. And so there was an uproar and I think it's mostly over. I don't think many baby I mean, seals good, are clubbed good. anymore. Okay, hopefully. We moved on to chickens or something. Um, in the context of faith. Okay. This is Elisa. This is Zoe Girls. Uh, definition of deconstruction. In the context of faith, deconstruction is the process of systematically dissecting and often rejecting the beliefs you grew up in. Sometimes the Christian will deconstruct all the way into atheism. Some remain there, but others experience a reconstruction. But the type of faith they end up embracing almost never resembles the Christianity they formerly knew. And then she adds, I would add that it rarely retains any vestiges of actual Christianity. So this is in the uh, Gospel Coalition, on the Gospel Coalition website, so that we all know <sighs> that, that I, think we got, I think we got bored of CRT. I think CRT has lost our attention and we needed something new to get mm -hmm. alarmed about, mm -hmm. and it's uh, deconstruction. Okay, can I quote another part of the article that set yes. me off? Yeah. Oh, yes. She says, this is a quote, deconstructionists do not regard scripture as being the final authority for morality and theology. They appeal primarily to science, culture, psychology, sociology, and history. It's a pretty broad statement. And um, anime. They also, I, I appeal for my deconstruction. I appeal to anime. <laughs> so, okay. When I read this, there's lots of different points that we could take issue with, but I want to take a step back. Because the argument that she's making, the reaction to this deconstructionist stuff, sounds an awful lot like the way earlier generations of Christians reacted to alcohol. Hmm. In that there was they this belief that the Bible seriously. No, that 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 like she's saying about deconstruction. She's basically warning that deconstruction is a is universally a bad thing, and we need to not go anywhere near it. Oh, I see. Hmm. And. Hmm. Earlier generations would say alcohol is inherently dangerous and evil, and most people, you know, you take one sip and before you know it, you've destroyed your entire life and the whole community yep. because you are a yep. raging alcoholic. Yep. And and there's no nuance to the argument to say, you know what? Yes, alcohol, when abused, can be very destructive, but it can also be engaged in redemptively and maturely and thoughtfully and in a way that actually aids in community and cohesion and enjoyment yeah. of life and celebration of God even. And deconstruction is like that. Yeah, of course, there are ways to engage this in a really negative way that are harmful, but there's also a lot of really good redemptive ways to do it. But this article doesn't allow for that nuance and is just basically this loud shouting, screaming warning that I tried alcohol and it almost ruined my life. And maybe mm -hmm. that's very true for her when it comes to deconstruction. And I have all these other stories of people's lives who have been ruined by alcohol. Indeed, we could all name many people. And therefore, we need to not give any Christian sanction to this stuff whatsoever. And it it's very fundamentalist in its reaction and universalist in its opinion and doesn't allow for any complexity or nuance. And that's what I found most kind of upsetting about this article fundamentalist in its reaction universalist in its opinion sky jeton well i mean she says 
It's good. Deconstructionists don't believe in the authority of Scripture. Right. Really? That's a pretty universalist statement. I've asked them all. I ask them, whoever the they is. Yeah, I, ju I just think what happens when you just change the word and say, I, are you deconstructing? And you say, no, I'm reexamining my inherited traditions. What if I just say that? <laughs> and, oh, okay. Well, that's okay. That's yeah. okay to reexamine your inherited traditions, but don't deconstruct. Okay, I won't. I promise. It's like saying, are you drinking alcohol? No, I'm drinking wine. <laughs> I'm drinking grapes that were left out too long. Fermented, yeah, I'm, I'm drinking fermented juice. <laughs> Galen, help us out. I, I mean, I think the language part is huge here. I mean, she takes yeah. a dig at one point at an article that said that Luther was deconstructing. And she's like, no one that no one would have said that except for five minutes ago. And it's like, that's how language works. <laughs> it changes over time, what you mean by it. And it also is context specific. So I do think the little tiny bit of like truth in some of this, I think, and the concern that she's trying to articulate that I think is fair is if you go into this and you find a community of people online that are all using this phrase deconstruction, and maybe there are legitimately people who what they mean by that is my final authority is science or culture or psychology because I want a firm foundation for the things I believe and faith isn't really a firm foundation. So I'm going to find that in this other thing. I'm going to reexamine scripture. That's not enough. There are people doing that. And if you kind of jump into some deconstruction community online and you're not prepared for that, it might take you by shock and you might be led astray. And But we have to loosen up some control <laughs> with people to understand that like they're going to encounter beliefs that are counter to historic Christianity. They're going to encounter beliefs that really are cultural. And that might just be something that people, we have to kind of trust that, you know, whether it's parents, you know, parenting their children or churches trying to train their people, we have to trust one, that we're doing the best that we can and people are equipped well, but two, that the Holy Spirit is working in people's lives. Like we don't have to be so anxious and afraid of what they'll find out there on the internet, because she's not wrong that some people are doing what she has described, mm -hmm. but we, we can't constantly just be so afraid of people going that path that we don't allow them to ask questions or to use a word that does have a totally diverse range of meanings and kind of find communities of people who are doing that. I mean, the amount of young people that I meet all the time that the way they describe their faith journey involves a period of time where they were quote unquote deconstructing is so many what they mean by that in terms of what beliefs they reexamined and where they ended up, wildly diverse, like right, all kinds right, of different right. places. And that also is just the reality of the global historic Christian faith. Like there are people deconstructing completely out of that, but there are people deconstructing. I mean, she lists things like marriage reviews of scripture. There are people that are deconstructing out of a pretty narrow understanding of American evangelicalism, both culturally and doctrinally. And as much as I would like people to land where I land on some issues that I think are important, I have to understand that those are not faith salvation issues. And they are involved in this really diverse community of faith that can have disagreement. If they go end up in another church that has a completely different doctrinal statement, we agree on some very, very basic foundational things, but we disagree about tons of other things. I have to be able to say that's okay. And they're finding an expression of faith and they've come to different conclusions. And I want to continue to support them and love them and care about them as a friend. And if there are things I think are really important that they're wrong on, we can continue to have conversations. Obviously, we're all trying to kind of find the truth together. But to have such a sense of like someone could go astray, not only is to misunderstand what people are doing, but I think it's also to equate, there's moments in this article that I think really equate a particular brand of American evangelical Protestant faith with the whole church. And yes. that's really unfair. Yeah. I, but I, if, if we don't think we got it right, why would we be in our tradition? We should think we got it right, but we also shouldn't be so you know, sure about it, that we're going to hold people to just exactly what we believe and act really scared. If this, I mean, there's a place, there's another part in this article where she's talking about, we, this is a way into relativism. Deconstruction mm. is a way into relativism. And we talked about this a few weeks ago, but like, we have to be able to both say, we think that objective truth is out there. And obviously I think I've got a handle on some elements of that. Otherwise I would change my mind. But I have to hold some of it loosely because I understand that as a fallen, finite creature, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm not going to get the whole picture. And there are parts of the church that could teach me things, even if I disagree with where they've landed on an issue. There are ways of worshiping, ways of thinking about theology that even if I disagree with it, I see God working in those communities and I can be enriched by that because the Holy Spirit is working in those communities, even for people, I think, who deconstruct outside of the historic global faith. 
they are not Christians anymore. I think common grace is still active in them. And I can learn from them things about humans and communities and God just as much, just as I at the same time am praying for them to have faith in Christ if they wouldn't identify that way any longer. Because I think that that's good and right and how humans best flourish. And I want that for them. But I also don't have to treat them like they're so, it's so incapable, it's so impossible for me to learn something for them or for me yeah. to grow as a Christian in relationship with them. Do you, do you think it would be more palatable if instead of calling it deconstruction, we called it unbundling? I've heard people say untangling. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think of bundling as like a, a, a business practice where you put multiple products together and you have to buy the whole bundle rather than yeah. a la carte. Yeah. And I think there are people raised in, in let's say, white suburban evangelical Christianity for whom Christianity was bundled with certain cultural and political values. And they're realizing, oh, wait a minute, they don't have to be bundled together. You can still hang on to faith in Christ and express your politics this way or your some cultural issues that way. And and I, what I hear her saying in this article a bit is you can't pull on any of these threads. You can't disentangle any of them or the whole thing is going to fall apart. And it's like, well, that's ridiculous. I mean, even in the New Testament, you see Jesus' own apostles believed that faith in Jesus was intrinsically bundled together with being Jewish. And most of the New Testament is an unbundling mm-hmm. of those two things, saying, no, 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 you don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to follow a kosher diet. You can unbundle this and still be a follower of Jesus. And that's exactly what I see a lot of people doing today, is they thought being a Christian means I have to be a Republican, or I have to be against this or for that. And and they're slowly realizing, no, actually, you can be faithfully committed to Jesus without having those things bundled together. But because you call it deconstruction, it sends off alarms and mm-hmm. warning flags and people start freaking out. And it's, yeah, I, I just think it's an overreaction. I think it's an unhealthy term. Well, it didn't just, start that way. Well, you think deconstruction is an unhealthy term? Yeah, because it's just oh. it's just sounds like you're taking a wrecking ball to your faith. You know, kind of un, uncritically destroying. I'm so mad about my upbringing that I'm throwing everything away, and then I'll see what I want to bring back in. So, is okay. is disentangling or dis unbundling a better, less violent? I, I word? like reexamining my inherited tradition. That's what I prefer. <laughs> Um, Alisa believes that her pastor that was, had deconstructed was trying to turn their church into a progressive Christian church. And so I reached out to a friend of mine who's friends with Elisa and tends to agree with her quite a bit and said, what did, how does she define progressive Christian? Mm -hmm. And so he sent me to a article she wrote saying, this is what a progressive Christian is. A progressive Christian is someone who denies one or more of the following doctrines on this first list and then affirms one or more of the doctrines on this second list. Okay, are you ready for this? Yeah, this sounds very precise. It's very precise. So denial, you you may, you will deny one or more of these things. The atonement, the biblical authority of scripture, original sin, the deity of Jesus, the physical resurrection of Jesus, the virgin birth, the trinity, or the sinlessness of Jesus. Okay, you will deny one or more of those things. So not progressive. Yeah, I'm not progressive then. And you will affirm one or more of these things: LGBTQ relationships and LGBTQ marriage, universalism or universal reconciliation, the gospel of social justice and critical theory, pluralism, <laughs> and pantheism, panentheism or perennialism. So you what have a to weird have, list. You have to have one in each of those categories to be a progressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't have one in each of those categories, you're not a you're not a progressive. And I, I said back to my friend, it sounds like she just collected every heresy of the last two thousand years and put them all on a list and says this is progressive Christianity. Well, when mm-hmm. A lot of it, it was just you know liberal theology from the early twentieth century that we you know we've known about for one hundred and twenty years. I don't know. Mm. I, 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 you know, I mean, my conclusion was oh, I, clearly I'm not a progressive Christian, if that's what you mean by progressive Christian. But by just losing using the label, make sure your pastor isn't leading you into progressive Christianity. You know, it's a, a big, scary movement or deconstructionism or critical race theory or wokeism. We want these labels to imply big, scary movements that are coming for our children so that we are afraid of anyone who gets attached to one of those labels. So what what would she do with somebody who affirms everything in the first list 
and in the second list believes that systemic racism is real uh believes that we are called to seek the welfare of the common good of our community through systemic justice um i forgot what was else was in her list i'm thinking but like so, in some cases it is the bible itself and the historic christian faith that leads people to engage some of the things in the second list mhm <sighs> It depends on how you define that, how you define social justice and critical theory. Because if you define yeah. it as trying to destroy Western civilization and the Bible, well, then obviously that's not biblical. Trying to overturn Roe v. Wade and limit the number of abortions in America is a systemic approach to injustice. Yeah, I know. The two lists just don't really make sense together. And I think like implicit in the two lists is the idea, and I think this this is sort of communicated in this piece too, that if you start to question some things about marriage or gender, some things about social justice, some things about race, you're a step away from questioning historic doctrines of the faith, like atonement right. and the Trinity and, you know, the sinlessness of Christ. And it's it's so wild to me. When I was at seminary, I heard from people frequently that didn't know they were talking to me. Oh, did you know this Caitlin girl? She's so liberal. And then I, I, I learned like Wait, they said coming, that to you. They said that yes, to you. Do you, you know would like this her? Caitlin you would be friends girl. with her. She's so liberal. Oh, she sounds like and you. It's, it's so wild to me because now I'm in a much more progressive institution and I feel so conservative. And I think really the difference is in one of those places, the thing that makes you quote unquote liberal is social issues, gender stuff, you know, political right, questions. Right. And the other one, the things that make you conservative sometimes are those social issues. Sure. But I don't quite fit their expectation here. What makes you conservative is I hold to a pretty traditional understanding of scripture and atonement and, you know, the exclusiveness of the Christian faith, you know, so that makes you super conservative here. Mm -hmm. And the problem is when people think that one slides into the other, you've, you're equating kind of cultural, social issues, political issues with really foundational doctrinal issues. And then you scare people into questioning any of the things that are happening in their predominantly white evangelical churches, because you might just slip into some serious heresies. Right. And that's so false. Right. I think the first first thing to always say, if someone says, hey, are you a progressive Christian? Hey, are you woke? Hey, are you liberal? Hey, are you conservative? You just say, what do you mean by that term? When you when you use that term, tell me what you mean. And let's be more specific because there's there's a blanketing lack of specificity that we use as shorthand for rejection or endorsement of people on a very broad scale that is really unhealthy. Uh before we end this conversation, I'd propose that actually the most dangerous and most threatening person in a lot of conservative, however you want to define that, environments yeah. is precisely the person who holds to all of the orthodox teachings of historic Christianity and doesn't buy into the conservative political agenda because that questions everything they believe. It's far easier to dismiss the person who doesn't buy conservative yep. politics and has given up on the bodily resurrection of Jesus or the authority of scripture. That person you can throw out the door and go, oh, they're not really one of us. But if you really do hold to the Orthodox faith and you don't buy into the political and cultural agenda, then you're dangerous. And frankly, that's where most of the African-American church tradition is in America. Yeah. They yeah, are historic or, or statistically that. the most biblical, the most, most orthodox in their theology and the least like, likely to be conservative in their politics. And that's why a lot of white Christianity does not know what to do with the historic black right. church. And, and believe if you're going to, if you're coming from the black church and you're going to attend a white seminary, we kind of have to convert you socially, even if we don't have to convert you religiously. Yep. Jason, but we think something? they're the same. Jason. Yeah, I was just going to throw in, I've been called woke several times precisely because I work on this podcast. That That is, oh, the, like, that is hey the only thing that people, like, he's woke, he works on the Holy Post. Like, people have said that on Twitter mm -hmm. about me. And it's like, I mean, I, I, okay. I guess. <laughs> what, what do you mean by that? <laughs> exactly. What do you mean by these things that you say? So I just wanted to say that, you know, we okay. they don't even know what it means. That, that I don't true. know what it means. And it's, apparently it's just by being involved in this podcast means we're woke. I'm so, sorry. So sorry, yeah. Jason. So you're losing work because of your your uh controversial work. Uh thankfully us? no. 
No. Okay. Not as far okay. as I found. <laughs> hey, y'all. Thanks for coming on along. Thanks for being on the show, Caitlin and Sky and Jason. Thanks for being Patreon supporters. We really appreciate it. You help us keep the trains running. And we have uh, new stuff coming up that I hope you'll enjoy. And we have a great guest. <gasps> I know. Who, I even know who it is this week. Mm -hmm. I even know who it is. It's going to be great. Okay. You're going to love it. And we will see you next week. Bye, guys. My guest today is Tish Harrison Warren. She's an Anglican priest and the author of numerous books, including Liturgy of the Ordinary. She writes regularly for Christianity Today, and she has a weekly newsletter in the New York Times. Two of those recent newsletters caught a lot of attention, and that's what I wanted to talk to her about here at The Holy Post. The more recent one was a call to end online streaming services and to go back to in-person worship. Tish received an avalanche of criticism from people who are handicapped or homebound for this call to end online services. So I wanted to have her on to talk about her theology and ecclesiology and to further explain her point of view and respond to the criticism. The other newsletter she wrote was a really interesting critique of the pro-choice movement and the way making abortion really accessible to people but not making other choices accessible actually hurts women and children. So here's the problem I ran into. Our conversation got so long that we really couldn't fit it all in this one episode. So what we've decided to do is to jump into the middle of the conversation we had about her abortion article and then cover the entire conversation about the streaming online services. But the good news is, if you're a Patreon supporter, we're putting the entire conversation about the abortion article on Patreon so you can listen to the whole thing. One more note before we jump in. Tish talks a lot about the importance of visitation, pastoral visitation, and just the people of Christ visiting one another in their homes, especially when they're homebound and can't be at in-person worship. But Tish emailed me after the conversation realizing that she forgot to mention an important caveat. And that is in this moment of COVID and with people who are immune compromised staying home, it's really important that pastors and others who visit them make sure that it's safe and take appropriate precautions, whether that's masking, and vaccination. So keep that in mind as we have our conversation about home visitation. Okay, here's my conversation with Tish Harrison Warren, which we jump into in the middle of the discussion about her abortion article. So the, there's a popular critique of the pro-life side of the equation and, and typically on the right side politically that they care about children before they're born, but they don't give enough assistance to women and families after children are born to make that decision more viable. But your piece also criticizes the left, which loves to brand itself as pro-choice, but it sounds like a lot of what the left has put in place are systems that make it easier and easier and incentivize women to have abortions, but don't actually empower them to make the true choice between abortion and carrying a child or adoption or, or, or parenting that child. So you're, you're kind of spreading the blame on both sides here that we've created a really broken system that yeah. neither side should really be happy about. That's exactly right. And and the who um we have made a very broken system. And the victims of the system are unborn children, but the victims of the system are also women, particularly women in poverty. And um we have made things really hard for women in poverty. And I think the um accusation of hypocrisy particularly for the political right, for the GOP, um, for Republicans, that they care about children, you know, from conception until birth. Um, I, I want to say, I don't think that applies to like all people that are pro-life. I, I think of course. there's um, an increasingly uh, vibrant whole life movement that embraces um, both policies that make it easier to have children or to raise children, but also um, is pro-life. But I do think that Republican folks and lawmakers in particular, like, I think that lands, I think it's right. I think there is hypocrisy there that, that we um, want to kind of use abortion as a political volleyball, as a tool to get votes, but then not actually make it easier um, to, to, fully support life, life outside the womb. <laughs> um, but if, if there can be accusations of hypocrisy, it can go both ways that it just like, I, I do think if you say you're pro-life, but you're really just pro-birth and you don't actually um, try to help 
women um, in unplanned pregnancies be really empowered and able to um, raise kids, then there, there can also be hypocrisy that if you're saying it's all about choice, that you're not as outraged that there's no um, dorms for people who have babies, or you're not, you're not truly making the choice. In other words, you're not agitating right. for a pro-natal, like for a pro-birth choice to be a viable option for women, then, um, then I think, I think there is, I think that's worthy of critique as well. And but, I do just want to say like, once abortion is an option, once it's in the water as, as kind of one choice among many, um, it, it often becomes policy wise, like systemically the easier choice. It's cheaper. Um, children are difficult. Um, and so we actually have to have kind of a, a we, if, if we need, you almost have to be intentional about, um, creating an environment where women and children, particularly women and children that are not privileged can flourish. Um, that has to be, you have to put more effort towards that because the, I think the, the weight of the, of the current will sort of always push um, towards the easier solution. Yeah, this is the part of your article that I found most fascinating. It, I mean, you talked about the reality of, of being a young woman on campus who's pregnant and, and the inability to make the sustainable choice to have the child. But, but then when you transition, you talk about the just the work environment in American society. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the longstanding critiques of the feminist movement of society is that we have created a world for men and we've created a working environment that preferences men. And the, it would seem to me that the liberal progressive argument would be, we need to create a working society that allows women and women's bodies to function in the marketplace which means, and you recommend some of these things, like why don't we have more spaces for women who are nursing? And why don't we have um, you know, paid family leave and maternity, paid maternity leave? And why don't we have you know, more of these structures that are very common, for example, in much of Western Europe, where they have lower abortion rates and women are able to function more in, in the work environment. But what we've done in America, essentially, is maintained a patriarchal system of labor and then told women if you want to engage in the system, you need your bodies to conform to male expectations. Essentially, don't get pregnant. And if you are pregnant, end the pregnancy so that we don't have the inconvenience of a female body fitting into a male patriarchal work environment, which yes. sounds like the opposite of the feminist agenda. And yet it's the feminist left that seems to be the one that's most eager to defend the status quo on both abortion rights and the way we kind of structure our work environment in America. Isn't that contradictory? So um, I want to, I mean, I would consider myself a feminist uh, and I'm sympathetic to that idea. And that I, I mean, it was not long ago where um, women really were not welcome in the workplace at all. Right. right? And where you, <laughs> I mean, you just have these horrific, you know, watch something like Mad Men and you realize like, oh my God, the way women were treated until about, you know, 10 minutes ago was unbelievable. It was, um, so I, I have great gratitude for, um, feminism and even second wave feminism, which is, you know, kind of what you're, what you know, this critique would be directed towards. Mm -hmm. That said, I do think that we, so that's one, but I do think that we have the concern of feminists is if you take abortion away that you are, or if you, let's not even talk about taking abortion away because that's not what's on the table right now. What's being discussed in things like Dobbs is just rolling back abortion to actually still less restrictive abortion laws than something like France or Germany. Yeah. But, um, but rolling back any kind of abortion access that, um, that women will sort of 
the spiral into this like dystopic handmaid's tale like reality and it's and what i think that belies is that we've built a feminist movement on the notion of abortion on the notion of women's um bodies being um not places of fertility or places more like men's um bodies where um where they can um kind of i i think unfairly kind of opt out of burdens of the burden of responsibility of reproduction instead of actually building feminism on the flourishing of women and what it takes for um women to be able to fully participate i i just do not think that abortion should be the um price of entry for civil society. We shouldn't yeah. say that this is what women have to put up with in order to be able to lead and be successful and to have careers. Well, speaking of controversy, um, let's talk <laughs> about your other piece that came out on January 30th, why churches should drop their online services. After I read your abortion article, I wondered if you could have retitled this piece, The Systemic Realities Created by Online Services. Oh, wow. Um, that's really interesting. I and have... so that's the link I saw between the two of these, just as you, know, you talked about recycling and how creating um, a system for recycling made it easier for people to engage and how creating tons of access to abortion has made abortion more common and how changing those policies and structures would make adoption or keeping pregnancies more common and accommodating. Likewise, there are things churches are doing or not doing that reinforce certain behaviors and in your piece, you fully agree that during the pandemic, it was appropriate for churches to go online. It, it was um, what safety and, and the experts and everyone else. And, and I was grateful to see some statistics in here that there are only really a few churches, fringe, fringe churches that didn't go online early on in the pandemic. Um, but obviously the call of your piece is, hey, it's time to change those incentive structures and move back to in-person embodied gatherings. Let's start here. What is it about your theology and your ecclesiology, your understanding of church that makes mm. embodied worship so important? That's really a great question to begin. Um, man, it's actually quite a lot. Um, first of all, I am Anglican. And so the idea of the sacraments are really central to what I understand worship to be and the means of grace. And this really is something that we have to do gathered and we have to do um, in person that we, we don't baptize over um, online church. I and mean, we don't, I mean, this is changing. I mean, this is some, I've been surprised since this piece came out that people have sent me that there's a, there's a, um, VR, a virtual reality church that does cyber baptisms. Um, but I think this is a very bad idea. Um, so I think that the physicality of the sacraments, the Eucharist is a meal we eat together. The baptism is, is being dunked in water, right? Um, that this is an important part of worship. It's, um, so that's one thing. I think um, some of the theological underpinnings of that is the incarnation itself, that um, Jesus came in a body. Um, there is something unavoidably um, about any kind of online interaction. I mean, even this, to some extent, that is somewhat excarnational. Um, yeah. And that doesn't mean it's sinful or that... Um, it's, uh, you should never, ever do it. I mean, obviously we're talking and we're not in the same place, but I do think that it, we should really limit that. I mean, I, I'm not really doing virtual events of any sort anymore because I feel like that, um, there is, uh, an encounter with another that you have through in-person interaction that really can't be replicated. Um, 
in other ways. Uh, and I'm, I'm skeptical, uh, to say the least, of, of the faith that our society is broadly putting into excarnational in, encounters and community. Um, I'll also just say, you know, I am a person who cares a lot about spiritual formation. I wrote this book, Liturgy of the Ordinary, that's really focused on spiritual formation. And so I think practices really matter. And there's this old saying in the church um, that the law of prayer is the law of belief. The way that we practice, the way we pray ends up shaping how our theology, right? And so I think... Um, coming together to pray, uh, to have the sacraments, and to, he- to receive the word, to hear the word. I don't even mean sermons. I mean literally like listening to a dude read or a female. I'm not being gender um, specific there. A person reading like Galatians is part of um, how we've worshipped for millennia. So I'm not saying this can't ever be changed. I I'm not saying we can't ever innovate. I mean, my church has ele- um, electricity and air conditioning. But I do think that if we innovate spiritual practices, if we change them, we need to do that cautiously, very thoughtfully, and carefully. Because they aren't just um, kind of accessories to the faith. They, they really do shape what we believe, what we believe about bodies, what we believe about what people are, what we believe about what the church is. Um, so to, that I could go on, but I'll stop. Yeah, I, I know you You did not grow up Anglican. That's right. Um, and nor did I. And I, I'm imagining we've both had some formative years in the American evangelical subculture. And there's something interesting about that subculture, partly because it's American, it's very innovative and it's pioneering and evangelicalism historically has been um, somewhat motivated by the urgency of the gospel, the urgency of sharing that message broadly with those who haven't heard it or haven't accepted it. And when you combine those things together, it has led to an American church that is pretty eager to adopt whatever new technological forms come down the pike. Yes, that's right. Whether radio, television, podcasts, here we are. Um, But there's also this agnosticism about media that says the medium doesn't matter. That's right. right. What matters is the message. Yep. And when it comes to like online streaming of services, I know many churches have entered into that because of the pandemic, but a lot are choosing to keep it going because their attitude is, hey, the message is getting out there. Yeah. So who cares whether someone shows up in person or who cares if they're sitting at home and streaming it online, it, the message is going out. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate that. Um, part of the problem I have with that is this agnosticism about the medium. It doesn't apply when you go to other things. Like for example, um, you know, Paul in the new Testament compares the relationship of the church to Christ with the relationship between a husband and wife. And when you think about technology and marriage, It's not agnostic. Um, I I know that I could ruin my marriage with technology. I could Mm. destroy my marriage online. But I can't have a healthy, thriving marriage online. Like It Mm -hmm. requires an incarnate presence with my wife. Um, Likewise, so the, the whole point there is this medium can do a disproportionate amount of damage, but only a moderate amount of good. Like if I'm traveling for a lengthy period of time, it'd be great to be able to see my wife on a zoom call and communicate with her, but that would be a temporary um, crutch to what would ultimately be hopefully a physical reunion and and life together. So what do you, how do you help people understand that sometimes these technologies can be a blessing, but they also carry a downside or a burden when so many of us have been formed in this agnostic view of technology and media? Yeah. Oh my goodness. I have so much to say about this. And this is such a good question. I mean, I just feel like you're putting your finger on just exactly kind of what we need to be talking about right now. Um, I do want to say just like as a caveat, because the, the most intense pushback to my piece, which I think is valid, it was from folks uh, who have disabilities or we're speaking for the disability community. So I'm, right. I, I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going to sort of like 
acknowledge that I'm not talking about um, that specific critique right now. Like I, I hope we'll get there. Yeah, but, we'll do that um, next. So when I answer this, I am talking about for like the majority of people who can come to church, right? Who are able that are not bedridden or that are able to sort of yeah, that don't there's have no physical un- danger in in coming to church. Unique accessibility yeah. uh, needs. So, um, so that said, I think um, you're asking really important questions, and I do think one of the things I really appreciate about like Amish communities, um, Mennonite communities, folks that are, um, I think Bruderhof also would does this but um is that you know contrary to kind of popular belief or thought on this they don't just reject all technology they actually um you you have amish folks that use more advanced you know even electricity more advanced um technology there's um there's amish communities that have websites right but they come together as a community and try to think really thoughtfully about how this technology will affect their community, how it will shape them as people. Um, Will it make it where they're less reliant on each other? Because that's actually, we see that typically as a good thing, but they would say, no, that breaks the bonds of community, where if you're completely autonomous, right? And we need to set up ways that we rely on each other and need each other. So I think in this way, American evangelicals just desperately need to be like a little more Amish, Um, just in the sense that we're, I I think digital technology promises connection, promises superpowers, but it normally often leads to isolation and antagonism, anger. Now, That said, there are some really important things that digital technology does. It really does. I mean, I, you know, I call friends, right? We are talking right now. But I think we need to understand what these mediums do and what they don't do, what they're good for and what they're not good for. So Zoom, for instance, if you have four close friends that all went to college together and you love each other, and you want to get together for a happy hour on Zoom with your four friends, that could create, and you can't be together because you live in different states, that could create a good time of connection. But it's small. It's a group of people that know each other, that have a life together outside of this. If you get 200 strangers on Zoom, you're not going to be able to connect. You're not going to even know like when it's your turn to talk. Like You're, you're not going to know kind of, it, and it's going to be much more difficult to build a life together, right? So I think we need to know kind of who and what technology can can serve and um and the ways it really falls short. And I will say that like I I don't think that we're skeptical enough about this. I don't think that we're thoughtful enough about this and and evangelicals tend to just get on the bandwagon of the next thing. And I think I know. See, this is what's been interesting is is there's been uh, such an outcry against my piece. But before, I mean, four years ago, I remember friends and who are pastors, and I'm saying like across the theological aisle, pe- people who would be considered very kind of liberal, quote unquote liberal and conservative, who would just mock like televangelist and people wanting to start online church, right? Because they even though throughout all their theological differences, they had a sense that church is supposed to be about shepherding a group of people living life together. And that there was something about the um, excarnation of that, that was, that was troubling. Right. And so I am saying this didn't like rise for me that I don't like online church. Like I didn't, I don't think that TV cameras in church is a great idea. I, um, so I will also say one of the the responses I got to my piece is similar to what you're saying in that people would say, but um, 
don't, don't we, isn't this a way of outreach? Isn't this a way to kind of like get people to hear the gospel? Maybe they'll be, you know, on Facebook one day and happen to see our church pop up, you know, and then they'll hear the gospel. So God can use anything. Absolutely. Like that's certainly possible. People become Christians in crazy ways. God in the Bible talks through a donkey, right? But I think um, there's also something in there that American evangelicals are very interested in making converts or making church members, but not necessarily making disciples. And disciples, that, that has to be kind of life on life, like a reality where we are living life together. And it has to have to do with the means of grace, sacraments, prayer, scripture. Um, and so I will say this because, because the uh, Episcopal, I got some pushback from, from Episcopalians about this. So I, I want to say I got a letter from a, a female Episcopal priest this morning. Uh, and um, she liked my piece and, and resonated. And she said this, she said this one line that really stuck with me. And she said, as pastors, we need to be in search of relationships, not views. Hmm. And I do think that um, we do need to make a distinction there that I don't, I, I think that we can get swept up uh, in sort of giantism, just wanting to get as many folks as possible, as opposed to um, how can, how do we actually know and love and shepherd a, a group of people, you know, and a specific group of people. Yeah, let's, um, I, again, amen. I couldn't agree more. And, and the metaphor that I think is probably the most frequently used in the New Testament to describe the church is that of a household or a family. Mm -hmm. And when you think about whether it's marriage or parenting, these are fundamentally relational connections that require incarnate community. You can't parent your children digitally, although we may employ those devices from time to time. I certainly like being able to text my kids or whatever, but it it has to be an incarnate community. Um, let's Can I say to one more thing? One sure. more thing about that is just, um, I have been surprised how much this has shown me that folks, we've really come to see worship services, church, we see church as kind of music plus content. Right. And so if that is what church is, music plus content, then of course we can receive it digitally. I mean, we receive all kinds of content digitally yeah. and all kinds of music digitally. But I think I just fundamentally reject that notion of church, that it is not music plus content. It is an, it is an incarnational community of people that is, is, um, is held together by the word and sacraments and, and, and the presence of God, right? And so um, I think some of the pushback is that I just genuinely have a different ecclesiology than other people do. And um, that doesn't mean I don't love those people or they can't love me or we couldn't be good friends, but it probably means that like, I just don't understand church the way they understand church. Yeah, and, and we talked about your piece a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, and I think that's exactly what some of the criticism was rooted in, is if you believe that church is primarily content, music, sermon, preaching, whatever, and here comes Tish saying we should stop streaming it, then what you're basically saying is people should be completely cut off from the church. But your assumption and understanding is the church is a community. Um, so the, my first encounter with your article was actually not the article. I started seeing all the criticism of your article on, I think, Twitter. And I was like, this can't be right. So then I went, because I've read some of your stuff before, I thought, you're too thoughtful. You didn't. I had assumed that you just completely ignored the question of people who were homebound or disabled or immune compromised or what, that you hadn't addressed it in your piece. But I was glad to see when I read it, it, it's right there. Like you address exactly that dynamic because it, as you say, it's not new. This has been a reality that the church has had to accommodate for 2000 years. Um, and you've had your own experience of not being able to attend a worship gathering for some time. Um, talk about how both 
your experience and historically how the church has sought to minister to parts of its body that can't gather on yeah. Sunday and how that informed the way you wrote this. Yeah. So, um, certainly I wish, I, I think a lot of the, the critique and the questions and, and the, um, real valid concerns raised by people with disabilities, um, are good and right. Absolutely right to bring up. Um, but, um, not, but, and I think, um, I brought up the idea of home visitation of, so part of this again, like just comes down to the fact that I'm Anglican. <laughs> So, um, wait, let me back up. I want to say this, particularly to folks with disabilities. I heard a lot of hurt last week, and that's very real and important. But I also think we're conflating a bunch of questions that if we completely conflate them, we're going to get bad answers to all of them. And I think we're conflating a question about how do we best care for folks with disabilities or with unique accessibility needs? That is, that's one question. How do we do that best as a church? How do we support people? How do we empower people? How do we do this well? And then there's the question of online church. Is that a good formational thing for people and for the church as a whole? And we're conf with the question of how do we come back, how, how do we return from the last kind of two years of COVID? And I think those are all different questions. And if we make them one question, then we're going to just get bad answers to every question because they're different. So, um, so we do definitely need to, I think one of the things that this revealed is that there's a lot of folks who have disabilities who felt ignored by the church way before COVID. It was a much longer, bigger issue. Right. Um, and I think churches, I mean, one of the problems I, I really have with seeing online church as like the silver bullet for caring for, or, or online church equals, you know, supporting people with disabilities, um, not online church equals ableism. Like if we see it that starkly, then I actually think, First of all, that leaves out loads of folks with disabilities. I mean, I heard from lots of people in the last few weeks who said um, family members with intellectual disabilities, in particular vision problems, where online church is just is terrible for right. um, some folks. But I also think it does... Um, online church in some ways ask very little from a congregation. Where in reality, I think um, caring for folks with disabilities needs to look, and I, I shouldn't even say caring, supporting, empowering folks with disabilities and loving folks with disabilities it needs to be like fully orbed. And so it's going to be really tailored to that individual person that you know, and you know their story and you know their needs and you're responding to that. And so that might look like, you know, it could end up being like, streaming a service for a small group of people. I know I heard, I heard from a church that decided online church was doing really bad things to their community, but there was a handful, like five folks that, that were homebound that they continued to just give the link to those five folks, you know? And, um, but I think also, you know, if it's a matter of someone doesn't, can't drive, like, you have a whole community, like figure out a way to give a person a ride to church, right? And the, and I this isn't just like abstract. I've seen this, right? I've I've been in churches with uh, our the, our former church had a very large um, ministry to adolescents and young adults with intellectual disabilities, and so yeah, you definitely have to make accommodations. Um, you need you know if you have like. All churches in America should have wheelchair ramps. I mean, that, that just seems like it goes without saying, but I'll say it. Um, so we need accommodations, but we need as much as possible to have accommodations that allow people to be with us, right, in person. Now, there are going to be times that that's impossible. And this is what you brought up. 
um, that I address this in my piece. There are times when this is not possible. And when we're coming back from COVID, there are some people who maybe three months from now, four months from now could come back, but because of specific, maybe they're going through chemotherapy or maybe they have specific um, immune, immune system concerns or needs. But I think, I mean, in, a, in the 1979 Book of Common Prayer, there's, it, there's this section called Communion and Special Cir um, Circumstances. I don't have it in front of me, but it says something like, when people have to be absent from church for a reasonable um, cause, that's the language it uses, for an extended amount of time, it's good if the priest will visit them on a regular basis. And, it's, and there's a whole liturgy about how to do that. Right. And um, the most shocking part of the response to me of last week is that home visitation, that someone coming to your home with the Eucharist, which in my view is the presence of Christ <laughs> and the word of God, and sitting with you, hanging out, seeing how you're doing, having a conversation, yeah, that that is less than, or, or the, I saw the language used was like crumbs from under the table, and that watching a service on YouTube is somehow more kind of quote unquote like the real thing. And you know, I I said this to you before we started recording, but I think you know there was a period of time. I had a after the birth of my son, I had a really significant um pretty very severe blood pressure disorder that kept me in and out of the hospital and kept me out of church for a long time, probably the longest I've ever gone, months. And the thing that kept me spiritually alive was people dropping off a meal, bringing me the Eucharist, one-on-one, -on -one, right? Um, and and walking through liturgy with me, having and checking in, right? Having a real relationship. So even if, I mean, I'm fine. Like if churches feel like there's a bunch of folks with disabil disabilities that, that are really, you know, asking for and, and needing um, online worship, I just would hate it if that was sort of like the end for that. I, I think that, I think that's so... Um, it's such a thin medium of interaction. And, and so all people, including people with disabilities, need in-person, incarnate relationships. Yeah, I, I agree. There, what, what your piece uncovered and the reaction to your piece uncovered, I think, is the widening gulf in, in American Christianity of our view of the church itself. So many of us have come to view church as an event. We see it as what happens on the platform. We see it as music and a sermon. And what you've just described is church as the body of Christ, church as relationships, people visiting you, bringing you the sacrament, engaging yeah. with you as a person, loving you, caring for you. And, and I don't know if anybody would deny that that's the church, but where we put the emphasis, it seems like we've so effectively formed people to view church as content and an event that now we're living with the consequences of that. And the pandemic has kind of brought that to the surface for many of us. Um, yeah, I think that's part of it. I think, um, you know, some of this <clears throat> that is probably my fault as a writer is like, I just think I value sermons less than other people. I mean, I, I like sermons, but in that season I was talking about where I missed church for months, like I never listen. I didn't even listen to a recording of a sermon, right? Like I just, that it's not that sermons aren't important. I preach and I spend a lot of time working on that. I just think that um, maybe that's lower in the mix for me than um, others. But I, but I also think, I mainly think that, that some of what came out was just folks who have disabilities, who have felt ignored or hurt by churches for a long time. Yeah. Um, and that needs to be a much bigger discussion than online church than online church being the solution to that because i just think there are better much better solutions um yeah so yeah 
Well, thank you for addressing it. Thank you for, you included some of those responses in a subsequent newsletter that I thought was a great way of acknowledging that this is a much bigger conversation and maybe we can have it and you can write more about it in the days ahead, but we are out of time. Tish, thank you for your thoughtfulness, for your leadership in writing. I'm grateful to have your voice on a platform like the New York Times. Uh, I hope it continues to grow and we will stay in touch with what you continue to write. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash holy post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit HolyPost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more.